thank you all for coming out. And it's a beautiful day, so you can go ahead and change the slide. I just can tell you two seconds about myself, just to kind of get a little rapport going. Uh, my name is Cherie Martin. I'm a faculty member at Sanford University. I'm a board member at uh, of the Alabama Rivers Alliance, and I've been on the board for probably three years, I think, something like that. Maybe going into my third, third and a half year, or something thereabouts. And uh, I grew up in the woods, basically, in northwest Alabama in the um, Colbert County Shoals area. And this is a picture of Spring Creek. It doesn't show up very well here, but um, that's, you know, I learned to play there and I learned to swim in the Tennessee River. And so I just have this great affinity with outdoors and nature and uh, want to do everything I can to help it. And you guys are on the front lines doing that. So I'm going to talk to you today about messaging in the media. So you can go. Um, other direction. So what we're going to cover, it's a little hard to see here, but we're going to cover about three different topic areas. One, we're going to look at the current state of the media in um, sort of nationally, globally, and in Alabama. And we're also going to talk about um, mobile trends, internet trends, and how that has changed the media. And we're going to talk about specifically some of the best ways to message in 2013. The old days, this is a photo of a gate that's locked, and in the old days, the media was essentially the gatekeeper. There was the traditional media organizations, newspapers, magazines, um, television news, they all were the access points for us to reach our audience. And so you all know that, some of you are young enough that you really don't know the old day where you didn't have a way to reach people in mass on the internet. But um, Historically, and even for some people today, they still have a mindset that to get a message out, you need to go through the traditional media, to go through that gate and get some credibility added to your message. And I'm gonna argue that you don't need that anymore. Obviously, it's great if you get media impressions you know, in a major news outlet because it can really give credence to the cause that you're working for, but it's so difficult today because of a lot of the changes. So. Um, you'll see here, during the era as the internet um, commercialized in the early 90s, and once it started to catch on, you see the, the ad revenue for newspapers and print. At first it was okay. Newspapers, print media advertising revenue started to plummet around the time that we started to see emergence of what is called Web 2.0, where people could go online and create their own content and share it. 2006 is when YouTube was opened up. Um, and around this era is also when Facebook became available to non-university folks. And Twitter started to catch on. So at the same time, all of the opportunities for us to communicate directly with each other beyond email, as that takes off, newspaper revenue starts to go down. And so that puts the traditional news industry in a tight spot because how do they make their money? Ads. It's you know since the era of the penny press, which was um, established, or the, I don't know the first guy who really focused on selling newspapers for a penny and making money through advertising was in the mid 19th century, and that model became the norm by the late 19th century. So all of the 20th century we saw predominantly ad revenue driven media organizations that, that had the keys to the audience. Because first of all, there weren't a lot of channels until the early 80s. You know, if you grew up in the 60s and 70s, you could watch three things, maybe four if you were lucky, on television. And if you had radio, you had AM and FM, but there wasn't a whole lot of variety there either. And newspapers, you know, you had a couple in each town. So in that sense, you had a little bit more diversity in the print side. But, um, as things began to change, and we see the loss of ad revenue, um, the industry had become, I wouldn't say it had never been profit driven before, because news organizations have always wanted to make money. I and mean, people started newspapers to make a living, to have a business, to have a, you know, a career path or whatever. But as the opportunities to monetize news started to go away, since we could get our information from Facebook or Twitter, or YouTube or whatever, we didn't have to go to those old options, our choices, 
the variety had changed. So go ahead and change slides. Um, we've seen a lot of calls for journalists to acknowledge the reality that they're in the business of making money. They might hold themselves up to be you know, purveyors of fair and balanced and accurate information, but in reality, they're the job from the corporate side of things, the job of journalism is to bring readers to a page, whether it's online or on a piece of paper, to bring those readers eyeballs so that advertisers have an opportunity to get their message to this audience. And so news is a vehicle for that. Sports is a vehicle for that. Entertainment is a vehicle for that. Now that we have so many choices, it's um, you've seen a rise in entertainment-oriented news. So if you watch the evening news or local television news in whatever market you're in, you will see a lot of chit-chatting, and that's been happening since the late 60s, early 70s, where you get this family-friendly news anchor people talking to each other as if they're best buddies. And, you know, there's a lot of chit-chatting about what's coming up next, but there's very little news. You might have seven minutes of news on a 30-minute newscast, and two or three minutes of weather, and five minutes of sports. And that shift is continuing to happen. And this is just a, an example of another voice telling journalists to quit whining about it to get the reality and make changes or they're going to go out of business. So go ahead and change there. You know what happened in Alabama, right? So we have Advanced Digital. It's a New, Jer New Jersey-based organization, company, that owns... Um, one, one of its divisions is the Alabama Media Group, which owns the Birmingham News, Huntsville Times, Mobile Press Register. And so last year, we see the shifting sands of media because the idea is we have to become more digital. That's their saying to themselves. We have to be, build up the digital property AL.com, which has, you know, gets a lot of traffic. We bring more people there. We put more of our traditional print content on AL.com. We cut back print production to three days a week. We lay off a lot of journalists. Go ahead and change. So that's what we have happen. And this is not to you know, be mad at these people. They're just doing their job. This is the career they, they have set out for themselves. And so statewide, you have on the website, this is the audience they can deliver to the advertiser. So this is sort of the message that they're putting out there. But the guy here I've circled, um, I'm sure he's a great guy, I don't know I'm nothing bad about him, but his title is VP of Content, not VP of News. And I want that to sink in, so just hold that thought as we talk about this because it's, you know, news is a part of what they do. Journalism is in the sense of reporting on facts and events and issues is part of what the news media does, but it's only a little tiny part because their goal is to sell eyeballs to advertisers. That's the current revenue model uh, under the traditional sense. Everything on AL.com, as far as I know, is free still. And so it's not a subscription-driven model online. You have to subscribe to the newspaper. And I think if you subscribe to the print edition, you can get a little bit more information online. You get the same thing you get in the print. But the only way you get that is to subscribe to the print. So VP of content, not VP of news, okay? Um, and this is just to point out that they do cover environmental stories, but it's very difficult. And you'll see this example is a court case. And I went and checked out um, Kent Falk, and his beat is the court system. His beat is not the environment. His beat is the court system. And so if you have a story that is about litigation, he's a guy to go you know, cover. If there's something in the court system, a petition's being challenged or, you know, whatever. Um, there's also, this is the Mobile Press Register. <coughs> they have a, a green register. So it's a series of sort of blog type stories that you can get about environmental and green topics. So go ahead, change. And then Times Daily has a reporter. Again, this is a case, a litigation, you know, a case involving environmental topics. Um, community newspaper holdings, you know, they have several locations in Alabama. So I just want to point this out to, you know, you have to know your local media market and you have to develop a relationship with reporters who do sometimes cover environmental topics. Go ahead and change. One last thing here. Um, we have Well, which is an independent news, indie uh, weekly 
print paper with a web presence that's pretty sizable web presence that was launched in Birmingham. Um, the online version about 18 months ago and then they had a print edition and so they've been around probably a total of about 18 months now and they have partnered with the Tuscaloosa News at the first of the year to get home delivery of the Weld print edition if you're in the Birmingham market and you subscribe to the Tuscaloosa News. So it's a part and they also have a partnership with CBS 42. So the idea here is that um, in terms of traditional media relations, which is the way people have historically with the gatekeeper approach, tried to get their news and their information and their issues to be reported on by the traditional news media. And to do that, you had to send out a news release, get it to a reporter who would cover that, and get them, you know, have enough interest in it to cover it. Well, with all of the consolidations and these partnerships, there are fewer and fewer journalists actually working in the field. They're all overworked, they're underpaid, and they're being expected to not just report on stories that you know, have been either assigned to them or that they've identified as important, but they also have to write several versions of the story to get it online really quickly. They have to perhaps do a Facebook update that's a slightly different version of it. They have to tweet about it based on their guidelines. They may also, today, this is the, we're shifting in this direction very rapidly, they may not just write a story, they may have to have a flip cam or other video camera with them to do a video version that they have to quickly edit in the newsroom and get it online. So they got a lot to do and they, they're covering a lot of turf, not just a single environmental fee. I think the New York Times recently canceled their environmental news beat. They're still covering environmental stories, but they don't have somebody specifically assigned to be the reporter for the environment. Um, correct me if I'm wrong about that. I think I remember that. Um, and so the point here is, if you rely on traditional media relations, you're gonna have a really hard time to get your message out. So, I'm not saying abandon it. I'm not saying never write another news release, but there are a couple of things that you need to do if you wanna go through the gatekeeper approach. First of all, you need to have a newsworthy story, not just, you know, we're having an event, although that might get listed in the calendar. It needs to be something important that you tie back to the larger community that's gonna be interesting to a lot of people, you know, whether it's controversy um, over you know development or controversy over a species that may be vanishing or pollution of the water whatever the issue is you know frame it in a way that it's interesting and relevant to a bigger audience because they have to attract readers for this and then you need to before you ever get to that point start building relationships with the reporters who do cover from time to time environmental topics <coughs> Send them things that will help them in their job. Don't just send them an email when you need something. You know, find something, if you see that they report on a topic regularly that maybe isn't related to your nonprofit or your cause, but you think it would be helpful to them, if it's a good news tidbit, they will appreciate that later when you need something. But don't send them things that are irrelevant. So start to study your local community newspaper your local TV news and find the reporters who might possibly occasionally report, even if it's a health story based on environmental toxins or something. Find those people, cultivate a relationship authentically, not just to get something out of them, but help them. And in turn, they can at some point perhaps help you. And you, you know, we've always seen a lot of turnover, so it's an ongoing process that you need to do to build these relationships. But we're gonna turn our attention now from the gatekeeper to the new trends and where we are today because you don't have to get your story out through the traditional news media. Go. Okay, so this is um, data that came out in late December, uh, early December, from a lady named Mary Meeker. If you really want to know a lot about the latest trends um, on internet and technology and how society is going to be changing in two, three, five years, she's sort of a, a her job is to advise venture capitalists on where to invest their money for technology uh, and other up and coming 
advancements that are going to change society. So she studies what all kinds of people are doing, from research in universities to scientists to consumer product shows, what people are doing and how it's changing our culture. And you can find her reports out every year under just Mary Meeker, like M-E-E-K-E-R. Just search for her and you'll find her slide decks, but this is one slide from last year. And it's the point at which desktop computers are starting to fall below the deployed notebooks, smartphones, tablets, those kind of devices. So we're at the point where in the past we all were still tethered to our desktop. Um, today, most people are starting to shift, people under 50 shifting faster than older people. So depending on your demographic, you're going to have to make the shift more quickly or less quickly. But more and more people are getting their information mobily. And I'm going to throw this in so I don't forget to say it because I don't have it on the slide. If your website for your organization is not mobile friendly, preferably responsive to the device so that it's readable on whatever device they have, you need to get somebody working on that really fast. And there are some very inexpensive tools. If you don't have a WordPress <clears throat> content management system based website, I suggest to spend $500 to $1,000 max to convert your current site over to that. If you're just starting a site, build it on the WordPress platform to start with. It's not difficult, it's a DIY thing if you're starting from scratch. If you've got it on a non-WordPress platform, you probably need some tech help to get it converted, but it should not cost very much. And you put it on the content management system and use a theme that is mobile responsive then you can just customize it a little bit. It looks really nice, and then it's going to be friendly for all the devices. So that's something to consider very quickly. Um, and I can answer questions about that at the end. Anything so far? We're about to switch gears now. Yes? Can you repeat the lady's name that you just mentioned? Yes, her name is Mary Meeker. And it's KPCB are the initials for Kleiner Perkins. I forget the last, Caulfield, something. Um, they're a venture capital firm. So Mary Meeker. All right. And this is a picture of an open gate. So just to symbolize that we are now in this new era that you do not need to have um, your story told by the traditional news media. Even the new online news organizations places like Huffington Post or other portal news websites, we don't have to go through them. It's great. It is wonderful to get your story picked up by those, but you can build the community and tell your story without going through that. And this is a, just an example. You can't see it so well, probably, but this is the Tennessee River Keepers YouTube channel. And here are two others. And the point here is you don't even have to be an organization. These two folks are just two of a gazillion, maybe not that many yet, but of thousands of people who are creating their own shows on YouTube and building their business around an internet distribution system where they're either teaching people how to do something or telling a message that will inspire and help <coughs> other people. And they're doing it all on their own. They have a, these are free. You don't have to do anything. Go to YouTube and create a channel. I have one. And I would have put it up here, but I'm changing the design so that it looks better. So I didn't have that ready yet. Um, but you can now have the featured video. You can have below these, you will see channels that you could set up. So it could be, you know, where you are sharing videos from other environmental groups. You could have, you know, your local community causes where you go out with a, a really, you know, mobile phone cam and film pictures of toxins or poisons or runoff that's going into your community. Put those on the channel about you know, pollution. It's really easy to customize these. We'll talk more about specifics. Okay. And what this is called really, building a business around helpful information and teaching people, it's a, one way of describing it is something called content marketing. And it's, it's a, term du jour right now on the marketing side to the point that 
marketing people are saying enough, enough, quit talking about content marketing. Even though they're doing it and they want to do it, it's kind of like the buzzword is getting overused. But it's been around as this infographic season. I'm going to put these slides up online for you so you'll have those. Um, and infographic shows, you know, this info marketing has been around for a long, long time. And one of the best examples is John Deere. And started out where John, if you didn't know his name, I'll tell you this story. John invented a plow, a steel plow, and he was trying to sell it, but he wasn't having much success in getting farmers to buy his plow beyond what they already had. And so he started doing training sessions to demonstrate how his plow would work better and then evolved into putting out stories about it and tutorials in the 19th century way. And in the early 20th century, early 1900s, the John Deere company launched a magazine that's still in circulation today and they give that magazine or sell it, share it with people and the whole purpose is to help sell the tractors and the implements that John Deere produces. And they do that by educating people through their own media outlet. They don't pay for advertising. They do advertise. They still do traditional paid advertising. But they also communicate. And all of you, I'm sure, get tons of free publications from your insurance company, depending on which insurance company you have. You may get it from Lowe's Home Improvement. They send out a thing on how to do home DIY projects. Depending on what you sign up for, they'll send you all kind of free stuff. My mother had me sign up for her, and now I get all of it at my house. I'm like, turn it off. You know, it's like good stuff, but it just comes on constantly. And so you don't even have to do it print anymore. You can do it online free. This is sort of tracing big examples of content marketing. How many of you drink Red Bull? Nobody? Well, every once in a while. Red Bull is so content marketing driven that they actually created, created an in-house media company where they produce extreme sports videos and sell those to other companies who want to use that in their advertising. So they actually have an in-house media, Red Bull Media, and they have a magazine and so forth. Coca-Cola is starting to shift its approach to advertising. They're still going to do paid traditional advertising. Coke is big, it can afford it. But there's a video, look for um, the Coca-Cola Content 2020 videos on YouTube. Spend about 15 or 20 minutes watching how they're about to change their approach to marketing or try to take it to the next level. And they're going to be relying increasingly on Coke consumer to help tell the story of Coke through content marketing. So go. So what I want you to think about, and this is the how-to part now, we're going to focus on this. Um, I want you to think about yourself as your nonprofit, your individual. You don't have to even be the leader of a nonprofit or a for-profit business. You can create your own platform, your own channels online, and distribute your message and build your community, and then try to get that shared so that it reaches a wider audience. So we're going to walk through some of the things that you would do to make that happen. And the most important thing is your website. Because not everybody is on Facebook or Twitter, and people are leaving Facebook. Not everybody is yet on Pinterest, but there are a lot of people on Pinterest. So you can't pick one of these free channels as the only place that you focus. You want to start with your website that you own and you control, and if you know, suddenly there's a big shift in popularity, then your stuff is still there and you can just share it on the next channel. That's important. So that's why it's really important to get your website mobile friendly because people are not going to go to their computer and type in an address. They're going to touch a screen and scroll to it and if they have to start zooming in to get it or they can't find a way to click because the links are buried in some pull down menus that don't work on a mobile device, they're going to leave very quickly. So do that. Put your stories on your website. And I wanna, I'm going to come back and tell you what I mean by put your stories on your website after we go through these a little bit. We're going to work through an example together. Um, stories on your website. And if you have it with a content management system, it's going to be really easy for you to update with your videos, with um, quick 
shares from other websites. You know, you can grab something, grab a link, have a highlighted paragraph and link back to that source. You don't have to write everything or shoot lots of fancy video. People like authentic <coughs> videos, high produced, glossy, you know, that's fine, but they're usually not as interesting as the things that are real people talking into their phone or taking a picture of, you know, shooting a video of something that is happening on the moment. Um, and then you want to select the channels that you're going to distribute through, not necessarily all of these. So I want to talk about some. I use MailChimp here as an example because it, there's a free component to MailChimp. If you don't have a really good email um, list and a good email system to send out emails that you can customize or manage easily, you might want to look into MailChimp. They have a free element for up to 500 emails, so if you're a small nonprofit, you could use MailChimp for free to send out your you know, monthly or weekly emails. You can do up to 12,000 emails, so 500 you could send out, if you had 500 people on your list, you send out four emails a month and stay within their free pricing. Um, it's only $10 a month if you go a little above that, and you know, if you get 100,000 people on your list, it gets to be a couple hundred dollars, but it's, the price is competitive with the other providers that they have the free element. Um, so make sure that you have a really good email list that people have opted into. You know, take your notepad, your meetings, have them sign up, but they're gonna have to confirm it with these services. So, but you wanna do that because it's, if you just are keeping it in an Excel spreadsheet or some other <coughs> manual device, it becomes difficult to manage, you forget to add people to it, you wanna automate it. And so use one of these kind of services. Constant Contact is another. Eye Contact is one. AWeber has a version. Um, there's others that are sort of target nonprofits. Um, so you know about those. But MailChimp is a good one. <coughs> <coughs> the other thing you want to do is if you're tied to a specific location especially, but in any event, you want your information to be appearing in the search engines very quickly. Google Plus is becoming an imperative for that. So even if you don't like to spend time on Google Plus, you still want to have a Google Plus page for your organization. And anything you post on your website, you want to post it to Google Plus so that it gets picked up by the search engines fairly quickly. There are some things you can do to improve search engine results, but that's a beyond the scope of this talk. I want to focus on the, the media side that you're going to create. Um, then, beyond making sure you just put it on Google Plus to try to get that presence, because Google has so much influence over what people find when they search for, you know, environmental issues in Choctahatchee or whatever. Um, okay. Um, the next thing I would focus on would be YouTube because environmental nature conservation is so visual and visual communications are the key to getting people to really watch and share your content. By visual, again, it doesn't have to be even a camera like this. It can be your mobile phone. You can upload it directly to your YouTube channel and go back later and, you know, reconfigure it or add some tags to it if you don't have time to do that when you're shooting the video. But get that out there and promote your channel because people can subscribe directly to your channel and they will get an email when you've added some things. They'll get you know periodic updates about what you've added and so that might ultimately bring them to your cause or to your site. And more likely than not you're going to get a shared of a good video than you would of a text update. So if you have a 30 second video of runoff going into the Cahaba or something, that's going to get a whole lot more looks and views and shares than you writing something that says there's runoff from this place. So if you can go out and find those visual somethings, and if you can't find video, just take a picture. And there are increasing number of businesses and probably nonprofits who are using Instagram. I checked. There weren't any super great that I saw. I was just really quickly looking at it. 
Um, but you could even have, if you've got an Instagram app on your phone, you could have an Instagram page for your organization and start putting things, you know, just, you know, highlights about your meeting. And you'll be surprised because a lot of people, that's their main preference now. You know, Facebook is not the place to be. It is a place for some people. But if you put all your eggs in the Facebook basket, you're going to miss a lot of potential audience, especially younger. Younger is moving away from Facebook. Facebook is where you're going to probably have the best chance of the social to get the over 50 crowd today on social media. Um, Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest are for the under 50. I'm not saying that nobody over 40 or 50 or whatever is on these, but um, that's sort of the breakout. And I've got statistics if we need to look at that. How are we doing on time? Um, 45 minutes. OK, good. Um, OK, so pick if you can't do them all. If you don't have time to manage a bunch of different social channels, probably pick between Facebook and Twitter, but know that you're going to lose some of your audience. Um, Pinterest is great for visuals. And so the thing is, if you're creating a photo, then there's no reason you can't put it on Facebook, <coughs> put it on Twitter, put it on Instagram, you know, put it on Instagram to start with and then share it around. But what you don't want to do, and this is really important, do not share exactly the same content on all at the same time for sure. Repurpose it. Don't just blanket distribute it. So don't use Hootsuite or TweetDeck or Social Oomph or whatever free service that you choose. Don't use those to blast out to Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, all at the same time. For one thing, you'll get penalized by Facebook, probably, for doing that. We'll talk about that in a moment. The other thing is, if you happen to have somebody who's following you on all three or four places, and they get that at the same time, they're going to get really annoyed, and they may unfollow you on Twitter, and they're going to, if they're a little more sophisticated, they're going to think you don't know what you're doing, and by sophisticated, just somebody who uses social media a lot, they're going to think they're just trying too hard. The other thing that's really annoying is if you're on Twitter, to get a truncated Facebook update shared on Twitter, you don't even see all the information. You have to click on a link. I never click on the link. Do you all ever click on the link from Twitter if you're on Twitter? Nobody who uses Twitter will ever click that link. So they're not going to see it. They're just going to be annoyed. And I don't unfollow people because I follow some nonprofits because I care about them. But it annoys me to get those truncated tweets. And um, some people will unfollow because of that if it happens a lot. So you have to craft a schedule. Spend a little time, an hour a week, if nothing else, creating, this is what I'm going to share about the topic that I care about this week. And I'm going to tweet about it. You know, you can program tweets to go out three times a day at certain times. And do that, and then have a different Facebook update that you're going to put out there. And you're going to put this picture on Pinterest. So, and have a schedule in the social media world, they call it editorial calendars, just like newspapers and magazines use to schedule their publications, they have an editorial calendar. Um, how many of y'all give presentations to civic clubs or other events? And you probably create PowerPoints, right? SlideShare, free, take your PowerPoints, Put them on SlideShare, and then you can share a link on Twitter and Facebook to that slide deck saying, look what I did. It creates links to your website, so that's good. It helps people find your site better. If you're on LinkedIn, you can also embed it in LinkedIn. But what's cool about SlideShare, you've posted it there. You can grab an embed code from SlideShare, put a blog post on your site saying, you know, even if you don't have time to write anything more than, you know, I gave a presentation to the Rotary Club or the Lions Club on Thursday, talked about the importance of um, conservation and natural resource protection for economics or whatever. And here's my slides. And it, just copy that embed code into your post. 
and people can see the visual of your slide deck right there. They can just click and look at it. So they don't even have to go anywhere. So you get the content, you spend all this time working on your presentation, you get to repurpose it for your website, and then you get to share it around the circle. And each time you do that, you know, it's, that slideshow is valuable information. And that's what people want to see. Even though they enjoy seeing cats playing keyboards or cats in boxes, I, I look at them. But, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you had a picture of a little critter swimming in the, you know, creek that you're concerned about or the river? That's going to get shared more than just a picture of the river. So you know, if you can catch a beaver somewhere, then it's going to get a lot of attention. Yeah. So when you're looking at identifying which of these <coughs> outlets to spend your time, do you base that on the demographics of your membership currently, <coughs> or, or should we look at it as who we're targeting? Both. Or both, both okay. really. I think if you're wanting to grow your membership, you've got to look at the target audience that you're trying to reach. So if you're trying to reach college students, you want to be on Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, and if you have to pick between those, probably Twitter and Instagram more than Pinterest for environmental stuff. Do you um, have data on that? I do, and I have it with me, actually. Um, but if, since I won't have time to read this, I will leave it, but you can, I'll tell you the link here. Um, Pew uh, Research Organization, Pew, P-E-W, they do um, an couple of different annual surveys of how people are using technology, internet, mobile data. Um, the Pew, it's pewinternet.org, and you'll find more charts and data there for free that you know what to do with. But this one I came up with is how people are using social networking sites, and it's the specific data by age group for the main platforms I'm talking about here. So I just printed that out to bring if you want to see it. Yes. Quickly before you read that, why do you not include LinkedIn, or how do you see them being used? Oh, I think they're great. Um, part I was assuming that most people are going to have limited resources, but I think LinkedIn is awesome. Um, you can have a LinkedIn page for your nonprofit. The Nature Conservancy does a great job using LinkedIn as a resourcing, uh, a networking and resource, especially for fundraising. You could probably do a whole presentation on LinkedIn for fundraising because people who are on LinkedIn are going to be more affluent. They're either looking for a job or they have a job and they're networking and they're professionals. So your contributors who are um, fairly technologically savvy regardless of age are going to be on LinkedIn. Um, yes? So my other question, I mean this is really great information. My question would be, if I have intellectual property, I have my slides pointer, my movies, mm -hmm. it, is that my copyrighted information even though it's hosted, like for example, on Google? Yes, yeah, so you want to check the terms of service, first of all. Um, Pinterest, not Pinterest, um, Instagram got into a little hot water recently because they changed the terms of service and they were going to say, your photos are now ours. Um, people went ballistic and they switch back very quickly. So you always have to check your terms of service. But with YouTube under the current structure, the videos that you put on YouTube are your videos, assuming you create them yourself, then you have the copyright in that. You're just allowing YouTube to show those videos. So when you sign and set up an agreement to open an account on YouTube, by putting a video there, you're consenting and agreeing to the terms of their use, but they say, you know, we don't take your copyright. You're letting us use your copyrighted material. It's a lot of work. But you can get a system going so that it's less work. And if you, one, this is a rule of thumb on Twitter, We're kind of jumping around a little bit, but that's okay. Um, on Twitter, try to keep it actually to 120 characters. That way people can share it. Because a lot of times I will start to retweet some of my environmental causes and I will find the tweet is 140 characters exactly and I can't figure out a way to modify it a little bit so that I can retweet it without a lot of work and so then I just don't retweet it. So if you can save your followers a little effort, make it 120 <coughs> characters and then they can just hit retweet if they like it. Um, sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you have to make it long and have a link built in and that sort of thing, but that's a, a trick to help. 
The other thing is, if you just post something once on Twitter, it's not going to be seen by maybe 10% of people because everybody's not on Twitter constantly. And most people who are used Twitter a lot don't sit there and scroll back to see what they missed. They have a lot of people, stuff coming through, and so you have to maybe put that same tweet out four times at different times of the day, not four times in one day necessarily. Maybe on Monday at 9, and Tuesday at noon, and Wednesday at 3, and Thursday at 7, or 8, or 9 p.m., or whatever. There's some free services that you can find online to get statistics to help you see when people that are in your Twitter stream are on Twitter. So it, it will help you kind of identify when it's best to get interaction. You can also get some of that information with Facebook, about Facebook from your admin information. Um, but so Facebook has this thing called edge rank that doesn't, anything you put on your Facebook page doesn't automatically go into the news feed of the people who liked your page unless they subscribe to you. So you want to encourage people who like your page, now that you've liked the page, now please subscribe to it so that everything we share on Facebook will at least be in your news feed. Even if you don't see it, it'll be there. Right now, depending on the size of the organization and the number of followers, you may have your stuff showing up in anywhere from 10, 15, 20 percent, maybe 40 or 50 percent of your followers might have it in their stream. If they're on Facebook, they might see it but they would have to scroll down. So if you have something really important, I haven't used promoted posts yet, but it's supposed to be fairly inexpensive to even target beyond your followers. So if you wanted to target all of the people in your watershed, you could probably buy a promoted post on Facebook for 20, 30 bucks and get it into the news feed of everybody in your watershed. And that's what Facebook is moving to. They want people who want their message heard or seen to pay for that stream. And that's so they don't, you know, people didn't really want to pay for ads. That didn't work so well. But now you get the post promoted in the stream, and that's the direction that Facebook is going. And Twitter has that too. Um, question? Um, you know, I, I think we're all thinking some of the some of the work that this is, and if you've done it, it is. Mm -hmm. it is. Now, and I'll, I'll show myself to be one of those unsophisticated social users. I, I use my, my WordPress to propagate mm -hmm. a lot to the other right. to the other things. I want to continue to do that, mm -hmm. but now I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your cautions that, hey, it, 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 it doesn't fit in different places. Mm -hmm. But I still want to do something like that and use my WordPress to be my editorial calendar. Okay. Uh, can you speak any to that? With some of the plugins that. Uh, Gosh. Yeah, I don't. There probably are, but off the top of my head, I don't use a lot of automation <coughs> myself because social media is the, the goal of it, and the reason people like it is that it's an opportunity to interact with people. And so for my philosophy for myself is that I don't want to be tweeting when I'm not on Twitter at least for two seconds to reply to somebody. Um, so I can't tell you specifically which plugins to use to schedule that through your WordPress, but there is TweetDeck will let you schedule different times for different services. So does Social Oomph is another free one. It's not quite as pretty of an interface. Um, and there's probably a way to get the plugin and configure WordPress so that it's going out at different times, but I just can't tell you off the top of my head. If you give me a little bit today, if I have a work internet access, I can find one, <laughs> or I can email you. Sorry. No, no uh, that speaks to what I other, other questions? One of the things that, um, and then again, this is research from the big organizations, not my personal experience, but what I'm told is that if Facebook sees your update coming from an automated service, that's another way they will penalize brands, by brands I'm including any kind of organization. So your Facebook status should really be posted from Facebook. Twitter doesn't penalize you for that. So 
Um, when you say penalize, is it just that particular post won't show up, or is it like you so your whole no posting? No, so for that, so if they see that it's coming from a third party, just that one. Specific. Yeah, so they like they might have it programmed so that. 40% of what you put on your Facebook page goes into the news stream of people. Or, and it goes into 40% of your followers' mm -hmm. news stream, unless they're subscribed. So for that scheduled from another service, it might be 15% for that one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what, it must be enough that these big brands that have the technology to track it carefully can measure that and see what happens. But it does affect it slightly. That's just, and um, there are some more changes coming with Facebook. I think the news feed is looking more like Google Plus. I have, it hasn't happened on mine yet, but maybe on yours, has anybody experienced it? It's gonna be much more like the Google Plus look from the pictures I've seen and what people, have, it's, they're rolling it out right now. Any other questions about this? So, with Instagram, you don't have to use the filters, and so that's a really, you know, that's a useful way to say it. it's just popular right now among people, um, probably under 40, especially, especially college students like it. SoundCloud, I threw up not so much because of SoundCloud specifically, but you see I got all kind of recording devices going here. And my game plan is to, if the video works out well, I'm going to create a YouTube video so you can go back and watch it again if you like. But it gives me something to put on my website. And I also have an audio separate recording going just in case the audio that I've got hooked up to the camera is not good. Then I can use it to create a podcast episode, which I'm doing a podcast myself for my little farming project I have going. And I'm using it to talk about environmental and sustainability issues. And so I can take this and do a how-to segment for my podcast. Podcasting would require a commitment that maybe you aren't ready to take. It's a really popular thing right now. It's increasingly important related to YouTube. What a lot of people are doing is they're taking the audio from their videos, putting them into um, iTunes as a podcast feed, and Stitcher, which I don't have a fancy car yet, or probably ever will have one, but a lot of the new cars now have, Ford has a deal with Stitcher, has it built into the cars? And so instead of listening to satellite radio or terrestrial radio, you can listen to podcasts that come through your car. And so that's where a lot of people who know technology are saying, I got to get a podcast and got to get an audience built because now I can reach people in their car during the 55 minutes a day that they're going back and forth to work and stuff. SoundCloud is a, a place that you could put single audio files. You wouldn't want to put a whole podcast on SoundCloud as it's currently set up. Um, and to set up a podcast the right way, you'd have to spend about $15 a month um, on a hosting service because you don't want to host those audio files on your website, even if it says you have unlimited files. And I can explain that later. But SoundCloud, you could do you know, just a three-minute appeal for a fundraiser. Record it into your computer microphone if it sounds pretty good. You got a decent computer, or if you Skype, you know whatever mic you use for Skyping or whatever. Upload that to SoundCloud mm -hmm. and then embed that recording into your email that you send out for an appeal. So maybe you have a special donor who is not going to want to be on a YouTube video, but they would talk into an audio recorder. You get them to give a you know an appeal for whatever cause that you, you're running a campaign for, put that on SoundCloud and then share that in your email. You could even share it you know, other places, not just the email. But that would get, you know, for fundraising, that would be a really cool approach, I think. So um, there are others, but SoundCloud is really popular right now. Easy to use. It's all you know, from your phone. You don't even have to take a Zoom recorder to your um, to your person, take your phone with a voice recorder if you have an iPhone or get an app for Android. <coughs> I'm not sure if it's built, it's not built in on my Android, but it's older, so. Um, record it at their house when they give you the check or whatever. You know, tell them, maybe they don't want to say their name, maybe they don't want to say how much, <coughs> maybe they just want to say, 
you know, why I support. You could do that for every donor. You could have an event and have a little table set up where you ask people to come by and record 10 or 15, 20 seconds about why they support Alabama Rivers Alliance and then share that through your different channels. So this is sort of the hub approach and you know there are lots of other places you can be and it's changing constantly you know these are the current biggies right now um, I've got a few other things I want to talk about so I don't want to completely run out of time so is it okay to move on to this yes um well if why don't we do that while we're here do what those little sound bites awesome you, is that something we can do it with me yeah yeah sure that's what I was thinking and then it can totally. go right to the yeah, what we could do is in, while everybody's getting in lunch line, I'll be here all day. We could do it any time. We just need to get out of anything too loud. I've got some better mics for one-on-one. Okay. I'm, just, I'm all can for that. see the process, whoever wants to watch it, because I don't... That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Totally. Download the app right now. Uh, there you go. You, you can log in and, yep. and post them directly. That's, that's it. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know about it. Yeah, and it's, and it's, um, <coughs> it's, a, it's just a really, you know... You're the reporter. Now, you are the media channel. I want you to, that's what the takeaway is of all this, is you don't need all that CNN, I mean, you know, you don't need it anymore. You've got your own, you've got your own, and it's so almost free that it is really free. I mean, you've got to have a smartphone. You've got to have an internet connection or access to an internet connection. But beyond that, you don't really need anything else just patience and time, and it's work. But by the way, before I forget this, on YouTube, you don't have to use iMovie or the other video editing. If you have a pretty clean video that you've like interviewed somebody, I can put this video up on YouTube and go into YouTube and edit out the parts where I walk to the camera, the beginning, I can't do it in the middle. I'll have to do it in two parts for this unless I put it in iMovie, but I can, um, edit the beginning and the end so it's clean. And I did a talk at the beginning of the semester at Sanford um, to some student, a student group on PR. And that's what I did. I just uploaded directly to YouTube and edited the front and the back and there's my talk. So I saw two hands, others, yeah. Question? Yeah, so I'm a bit nostalgic like the old story of journalism. So is, is there any place for like long form journalism? Or They're like actually, articles? Yeah, there is. In fact, for um, there's a trend for your website to move toward long-form journalism. So there are plenty of really good um, ways to share truly in-depth, meaningful stories through text and pictures. You don't want to just have words. But a lot of websites like The Atlantic and others are, are I mean, they have, you know, long stories online and people will read those, especially now that a tablet lets you read it, you know, without having a laptop in your lap. So I don't want to discourage you from telling long stories, but you want to put those on your website. And there are um, a couple of social, um, there's a new one that it's not open to the public yet, and, but you can see it, so you can go look at what people are doing, but it's a little bit longer. It's kind of like a social blog, except it's longer content. It's called Medium like any like small medium and large medium and you can go there and check it out and that's a place that you can share long form content once it's open to the public you'll be able to put longer stuff there so um how could we repurpose this throw out some ideas so we have this boring press release that's not about our group but could I do we, before and after photos of some kind of cleanup yeah show us before and after what the river looked like and yeah and and then what else how could you share it? I could find some thing like the dirty diaper, video it, and use that, tag that story to it. Mm -hmm. Get a video of someone kayaking or, or like a personal mm -hmm. anecdote of how the river was affected them. And how could you use the SoundCloud if you're out kayaking yourself or hiking? Listening to the nature. That's Listening to the right. nature? Or let's say you're at a trail then for the walls of Jericho, you're at Trailhead, and you know, somebody there from Vermont or Colorado. Wouldn't it be cool to interview them? Why did you come here? 
you know. And then, I mean, that's going to get attention for legislatures a whole lot more than saying, just don't do this because we don't like it. If you show them that we'll be better off, you know, in a lot of different ways, then I think, you know, that's going to speak volumes, I think. No. This is sort of the new way that the PR industry works. So if you are going to go the media relations route or you're working in an agency, you know, this is going to kind of be the roadmap for what they do. They talk about in this book all the stuff that I've talked about today. Um, but there is also the media relations component to it and how to plan a campaign. These two are a little bit more web specific. Um, platform is for really beginners. So if you don't really understand a lot of what I'm talking about or you don't use a lot of social media, this is a good place to start. This is my favorite book of the three, Chris Brogan's book on the impact equation. And what he does is take the basics and shows you how to really take whatever you're doing to the next level to really make an impact. And he has this acronym um, built around CREATE that um, where you have to connect with people and you have to articulate your message in the right way. And people have to have a relationship with you. They have to kind of see themselves in you. He called it ECHO. And so it's a really good book for kind of the strategic big picture thinking about how to do it, but there's a lot of how-tos in there as well. So this one is more beginners. If you know about Twitter and stuff, you probably would be bored by this book. But it's, it's a really good book, I think, for people that are not really familiar with how things have changed. So. Does it go as far as slide cloud? And I'm not sure that he talks about slide cloud. Uh, he's like sound, cl sound cloud? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not even sure he talks about, he, I think he does actually, because he talks, Michael Hyatt is a publisher, um, the, the CEO of uh, Thomas Nelson Publishing out of Nashville. And he uses all the stuff that I've done now in his role as a consultant and his own vision as a thought leader for leadership and teaching people about that. And so he uses all those and he probably talks about SlideShare because he uses um, Could we get your website? Yes, it's on the next page. Okay. So I actually have two. Um, the Ben Franklin Follies is where I traditionally put everything, and it was just kind of my personal blog that I wasn't promoting or anything. But I also I'm starting and just getting it set up. It's called Teach Social Business, and that's where I'll be putting this video and whatever I get from this, um, as well as writing something about it on the Ben Franklin Follies. But because um, I put all my Alabama River stuff on Ben Franklin Follies too, because it's I'm kind of repurposing that site to be about health, wealth, and wisdom, and how nature is such a big part of health and wisdom and that sort of thing. So anyway, so um, you can't see it very well, but BenFranklinFollies.com and TeachSocialBusiness.com. I'm on Twitter at Real Cherie. Um, there are a bunch of Cherie. <laughs> and it plays off because of real food and stuff like that. So, um, if you just Google my name, you'll find me all over the place. And email um, Sheree at Ben Franklin Follies or Sheree at Peace Social Business will get to me. You both of those two. Questions? Can I help you? I have one yes. question about slide share. Yes. If you go back over that little scenario about uploading the slide share and then how that gets distributed. Yes. So you have to tell it though. So let's say I take my, what I'm going to do actually this weekend, I was going to redo this presentation on my desktop and record the screen so that you can see the slides. So then I could share that separately. But what I can do, as soon as I finish, I could do it now if I had internet. Um, I could upload my PowerPoint to SlideShare. And I'll show you what it looks like. Oh yeah. Um, so there's a screenshot for that. So, um, so you put it on SlideShare, and it's just a site that has slide decks from everybody's presentations. But there, from within that, mm -hmm. you can actually create a bio that tells about your organization. It has a link to your website, and there's a little the slide display. Have you seen it at all? No, okay. But that's okay. Yeah. You know. So you have a little. It's like a little player that you do the slides. And then you have there, um, 
you can embed or share directly from that player. And the share button would let you share it to Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn. I'm not sure how many icons are there, but you can just take, it also gives you just a link to the slide deck that you could take to your websites and embed the link so they could click back to it. Or it gives you an embed code so that if you send a blanket email to your list, you could embed the actual slide deck in that email as well. And so when people get your email, they don't have to click and go anywhere. They can watch the slideshow from within their email if they configure it that way. Is that other questions? Yes. Maybe this is outside the scope of the presentation, but can you speak at all about like email messaging and like e-newsletters? Yeah, so this is where the MailChimp thing comes in. You want to have some kind of automated email system. Right. MailChimp is one example because they have the free element. So you create that and you can set up either manual updates that you send out. So depending on how you configure your MailChimp or Constant Contact or whatever, you can automatically blast out emails once a month, once a week, you know, every day. Um, probably every day is too much. You can, you can schedule those ahead of time. You could create a newsletter version of a print newsletter. And it takes a little bit of configuration, but it's basically clicking. It's not like you have to be a programmer. So you can go into MailChimp and configure a look for your email and put in your content and send it out. What There's a trend today, because people are on mobile devices, they don't want all of the really fancy layouts in an email newsletter. It's better just to send it plain HTML. And then if you have a PDF version on your website, they can go get it if they want to see it with all the color. You can, you know, you can enable it, but the... Um, I think there's research that you know it's it's faster and cleaner if you just do it plain, but you can um, send out that newsletter, or you can connect it to send out every time you update your your blog or website. You could send out those updates. Um, it just depends on how you program the service that you have. They do have data that gives you clicking information, so you know how people signed up for your newsletter if they clicked through to subscribe, if you didn't you know, get them at a conference or something. So you can see that. You can see the open rate to see you know, if I'm sending it out to 1,000 people, uh, how many are um, how many people are opening it. You know, typically, 15 or 20% is the norm. So if you're getting a 60 or 70% open rate, you know you're doing better than average. Do you recommend like having short blurbs to talk about work that you're doing? Like maybe several short blurbs or like longer stuff? I don't know. Yeah, so that's something that I would say you have to really test to see with your audience. Um, I know the college students, they don't like to open emails. So if you're targeting a really younger group, you're not gonna get a lot of traction with your email list, but if you're targeting donors and people who are passionate about your cause, then that's where you're going to get the most traction, I think, with the email. So personally, I'd rather see the full story in the email rather than having to click on a link to read more. And I think that's because of the mobile, because even though people may have smartphones, you know, if I'm here, I can't click to get a web because I don't have a I don't have a connection for, you know, I don't have a good signal maybe, or I don't have a good internet connection. So if I can just read it in the email that's already on my phone, then I could read it here. So, I, but I think you kind of have to test it, really. And that's, it's called A-B testing, where you try it one way for a while and see if that works, and then see if you get more opens, if you have shorter snippets, and then links to the real content. One of the things you could measure with that is if I just do a paragraph with a link for more information, how many people click through that link? Nobody ever clicks through for the first month or two, then maybe you should just put it all in the email and send out more frequent emails. So just, I mean, it's, you just don't know. It depends on the organization and the audience. There's not a one-size-fits-all.
for any of this. Yeah. You had mentioned that you were interested in the health um, effects of recreation. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you ever use blurbs about um, maybe someone's individual story about how how their mental health, their physical health has been improved? I haven't maybe yet. I haven't yet, but that's where I'm trying to go with it because I'm trying to create sort of a channel about things and storytelling is part of it. So I've interviewed Justin about my green stuff, the green building for um, my podcast. And so I'm wanting to do more of that, actually doing video as well. So I haven't, but I'm going to. So because I just think there's so much just recently, you know, news in Japan, they have parks that nature walks where people who are so stressed out by their corporate lives actually right. go into the parks to get mental health. I mean, it's like it's sort of part of their system to de-stress to do that there. So it's very well re researched and documented. Yeah, time? Okay, I think we're out of time. So you're welcome.